Um, welcome to the Equal Opportunities Committee. It's the third meeting of 2015. Uh, please set any electronic devices to flight mode or off, please. I'd like to start with introductions. We are supported at the table by the clerk and, and research staff, official reporters and broadcasting services, and around the room by the security office, and welcome to observers in the public gallery. My name is Margaret McCulloch and I'm the committee's convener and members will now introduce themselves in turn starting here on my right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Apologies, convener. Good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Sandra White, MSP uh, for Glasgow Kelvin. Good morning, Christian Alad, MSP for North East of Scotland. Morning, I'm Jane Baxter, MSP for Mid-Scotland and Fife. Hey, John Mason, MSP for Glasgow Shettleston. Uh, morning, John Finney, MSP Highlands and Islands. The first agenda item today is a decision on taking business in private. You're asked to agree consideration of evidence heard during today's meeting at item three and discussion on your approach to an inquiry on race at item four in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. Item uh, agenda two is an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights of our inquiry into the lives of gypsy travellers. I welcome the Cabinet Secretary and his accompanying officials, and I can I start by asking you and your officials to introduce yourselves and invite you, Cabinet Secretary, to make any opening remarks. Thank you very much indeed, Convener. I'll begin by introducing myself and the officials. Obviously, my name is Alec Neal, MSB, Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice, Communities and Pensioners' Rights. Uh, on my left is David Thompson, who's Head of Primary Care in the Health Division in the Scottish Government. Uh, on my immediate right is Leslie Irving, who's part of the Equalities Unit in the Scottish Government. And on my far right, I'm sure that's not the case politically, <laughs> uh, is William Fleming from the Housing Division of the Scottish Government. And it's deliberate, although we don't have every division or department involved in this issue, uh, I thought it was useful just to show how we're taking a pan-government approach to this whole issue of gypsy travellers, that we had somebody from health, somebody from equality, somebody from housing. I could have had somebody from planning, from local government, from education and from a range of other departments as well. Uh, but I wanted to give the committee a flavour of how this strategy is being developed right across the whole government. Can I say, convener, I'm delighted to be here again after my visit recently to the Equal Opportunities Committee uh, and to speak in support of the efforts of the Scottish Government in relation to the provisions for gyps the gypsy traveller communities. Uh, as you're obviously aware, after the recent cabinet reshuffle, I now have responsibility for this, although when I was Minister for Housing and Communities, I had responsibility five or six years ago uh, for this area of policy as well. And I'm fully committed to meeting the needs of Scotland's gypsy travellers who remain one of the most disenfranchised and discriminated against communities in Scotland. Uh, can I first recognise the great work done by the committee uh, itself up to this point, the two recent inquiries undertaken, Gypsy Travellers in Care and Where Gypsy Travellers Live, have underpinned our activity and shaped our agenda over the last two years. As recommended by the committee, the Scottish Government is working to develop an overarching strategy and action plan for Gypsy Travellers, which we expect to publish this summer. The strategy is being developed in consultation with a range of key stakeholders via the Gypsy Traveller Strategy Development Group. The group includes members of the Gypsy Traveller community themselves, which I know is something the committee places a great deal of importance on, quite rightly in my view. In relation to accommodation, ministers and officials have visited sites, have met with key groups and convened a national site working group to gather views and consider the issues further. Our role is to set a robust framework and promote good practice so those needs can be properly assessed and met at a local level. We have already delivered new guidance on local housing strategies and housing needs demand assessments. These stress the need to assess and fully take into account the accommodation requirements of gypsy travellers. We have taken on board the lessons and information gathered through our visits and meetings to now set out a clear plan of action for the months ahead. This includes publishing minimum standards for local authority gypsy traveller sites, which every site must adhere to. In relation to tenancies, we will also publish national guidance on the rights and responsibilities expected for every gypsy traveller site tenant. In addition, guidance on unauthorised sites will also be published. As I've stated previously, I'm committed to consulting gypsy travellers on guidance and decisions which affect their lives. Their views will be integral to the development of the guidance on sites I've just referred to. 
In the longer term, we're looking at promoting good practice on planning to identify the best way to help the gypsy traveller community make best use of its assets. As the committee will appreciate, the community is a diverse one with a range of needs. Improving attendance and attainment in gypsy traveller children is a key priority going forward. To support this, the Scottish Government has reconvened the Scottish Traveller Education Review Group to improve access to education. The group will develop and then promote guidance on the education of young people from travelling families and support the development of local inclusive approaches across Scotland which address some of the challenges faced. Draft guidance is expected to be ready for consultation by the end of 2015 with publication thereafter in early 2016. We remain committed to finding innovative ways of tackling the barriers to improving the health of gypsy traveller communities. For example, over 60 gypsy traveller families have now benefited via the Better Breaks programme and Take a Break programme, which provides short breaks to disabled children and young people with complex needs and their families. Both funds continue to be widely advertised in order to encourage future funding applications from the Gypsy Traveller community, including promotion via the Traveller's Times, in the hope of supporting many more Gypsy Traveller families in the future. Of course, this is just a snippet of the activity going on, and I look forward to taking questions from the committee in due course. But to give you an indication uh, of the five uh, areas that action will be taken over the coming months, uh, first of all, our equity outcome, the progress in our own e equality outcome uh, for gypsy travellers, which is, of course, to reduce discrimination against gypsy travellers, we will be publishing the progress in that in, in April. Uh, we'll also, in April, be, plan be publishing our planning guides on sites for local authorities. Uh, in May, we will be publishing our guidance on the quality of sites and also, as I said in my speech, the rights and responsibilities of both tenants and occupants. In the summer, we will be publishing the overarching strategy I referred to, as well as a briefing for local elected members on, on this issue. And then finally, as we've indicated previously, we will be running sometime, probably in the autumn, a marketing campaign to improve awareness and understanding of the needs of the gypsy traveller community and to try to reduce the level of discrimination against these communities throughout Scotland. So can I finish by saying that we recognise that resolving the issues faced by gypsy travellers is a challenge and our approach has been very much to look at qualitative issues, not just quantitative issues, and also to take all the key stakeholders with us because the gypsy traveller community is not a homogenous community, as people around this table know, and we need to make sure that we take a, all sections of the gypsy traveller community as well as other stakeholders with us. Solutions do require a collaborative working approach between the range of partner agencies, including national and local government, NHS, boards, education authorities, third sector organisations and the community itself and we are determined to do all we can working with the committee uh, to reduce discrimination with the objective of eliminating discrimination against the gypsy traveller community in Scotland and ensuring that in terms of health, education, housing and all the other amenities and public services that we normally expect of ourselves that they have equal access to these services on an ongoing basis. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for that update. We appreciate how you are into a tight time scale this morning, so I'll pass you straight over to John Finney to ask the first set of questions. Thank you, Convener. Uh, morning, Cabinet Secretary, and thanks for that update. Cabinet Secretary, if I, if I was a, a young uh, gypsy traveller staying in a, in a site, and that site for the first time ever had, um, had a street sweeper in the day before the minister arrived, and if the, uh, the utility blocks were painted for the first time in many years, urgently, um, over cables, beautifully white painted over cables, over windows. If the school, uh, the, the unit in that site um, was presently unoccupied and representations to have a safer route to school put in were, we were told um, there's no point, there's no interest. Why would I believe any of this? We're 15 years on, we've had repeated, and I don't doubt your good faith and engagement in this, but wh why would I believe any of this? This is just more words from remote officials. Well, obviously I would disagree with that, John, because... No, clearly, a little aye, bit devil's aye, advocate, but that yes. is genuinely the perception aye. that, it, you know, you must engage with these people in a one-to-one, in -one, and this is, they've, yes. they've heard all this before. Aye. Well, we are engaging with them, uh, but it, 
to be honest, it's not always the easiest of communities to engage in because of their long-standing, over decades suspicion, and very justified in many cases, of officialdom at all levels. Uh, and of course, we rely also on the goodwill and the intentions of local authorities and others at local level, because we can only set the national framework uh, and the policy framework, whether it's in health and education and housing and planning across the whole range of things on the equalities aspects. But we rely on others, not just to stick to the letter of what we're trying to do, but actually to do it in the spirit of what we're trying to do. Uh, and, you know, I'm going to be planning a series of discussions myself between now and the end of the year with the Gypsy Traveller community, because my approach to this job, whether it's Gypsy Travellers or tenants and local authority houses or any other issues, is not to believe what I'm told entirely through official channels, but actually to go out and find out for myself what is actually happening on the ground. Uh, and I think that's the best way of finding out is all of this stuff that we are doing with the best of intent actually having the impact we hope and are intending it to have on the ground. Because if it's not, we need to look at why not and sort it. Well, for the avoidance of any doubt, I wasn't questioning your bona fides and, and seeking to address this issue, but there, it's, it's an understandable perception. Absolutely. It's been very helpful. You've used the term discrimination and disenfranchised yeah. and, and a, on a number of occasions because that's how these people feel. Can you can you explain, Cameron, Secretary, when you say you, you, your engagement is directly with the Gypsy Traveller community, who do you mean by that? Because you're right to say it's a very, just like any other community, a very yes. diverse community. Well, well actually, I, I remember when I was Minister of Housing and Communities, there was a particular issue raised by Brian Adam, MSP, uh, around the Aberdeen area, and there were real problems in Aberdeen um, of a much more critical nature than anything that's currently that we're dealing with. And uh, I took responsibility for that. We formed a, a working group, and we involved the Gypsy Traveller community in that, and we, we actually went and spoke, and that involved the police it involved housing, it involved the, the various local authorities, it involved ourselves, it inv we involved Brian, you know, a number of other MSPs to make sure it had cross-party support as well. And we actually worked with the members of the community. Now, there's not a lot of formal representation groups in the Gypsy Traveller community. So my view is you have to go and actually talk to the people on the ground and find <laughs> out what their views are. Um, and as you say, John, sometimes they're reluctant to do that for obvious reasons and for largely historic reasons, uh, but also because they're still subject to discrimination very often and therefore they're not sure who they can trust and who they can't trust. But during that exercise, we went out of our way and I think we ended up eventually with a, a situation that was acceptable to everybody. The Gypsy Traveller community got a, the, the, the need for sites addressed. At the same time, the wider community uh, were satisfied that we had a better solution than had been the kind of makeshift solution that uh, happened previously, which caused enormous irritation both for the gypsy traveller community and for others. So I think you actually have to go and talk to people. I mean, um, a, a kind of a similar group is the showman's people. I've, I've got a meeting with the showman's people coming up uh, at the instigation initially of Dick Lytle MSP. Uh, I think it's the next couple of weeks, actually. But I'm deliberately wanting to talk to people who are from those communities rather than, if you like, the suits, uh, who are the kind of middle people between me and the community. That's right. Can, can I also ask about research? And uh, Is the Scottish Government pulling together research? Um, I think you mentioned MECOP there. In my own area, North Argyle Carer Centre do tremendous work in conjunction with, with uh, MECOP, with, with the Gypsy Traveller community. And also, we've heard that um, the British-Irish Parliamentary Association Economic and Social Committee uh, was calling on um, British and Irish jurisdictions to consider a strategy obligation in all authorities to coordinate provision. So I, I think um, that there is movement between the, the different component parts of the United Kingdom and also the Republic of Ireland. Can you comment on pulling some of these together, please? Absolutely. Well, first of all, in terms of research, I think we're, uh, we've had quite a lot of research going on because if you look at the work being done by way of preparation for the overarching strategy that's going to be published in the summer, which involves people from the Gypsy Traveller community, obviously, in that work, then obviously before you actually get to developing a strategy, you need to do the basic research. So 
What I'm going to do is demonstrate the pan government work that's been done, and briefly I'm going to ask each of the officials to give some examples of the research and the coordination work going on in their respective departments. So I'll start with David at this end, and we'll work to Leslie and William at the other end. Okay, that's fine. Um, thank you uh, very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, talking specifically about research, we've obviously we've done the research into handheld records with NHS Health Scotland, which has shown um, some of the advantages of that, but some of the difficulties in delivering handheld records, uh, both within the health service and within the gypsy traveller community. Uh, we're also working on, um, as part of our work on the new GP contract, which we'll have hopefully in place by uh, April 2017, we're looking at various different new models of care and how they address the needs of particular communities, um, particularly in the context of the new integration authorities and how they meet the needs of the local community. So we're working with GP practices um, on a number of different models, looking at different um, issues within communities. Um, we've worked with the Conan Doyle practice on, on some of the, the, the issues within their community in Edinburgh, um, and we're also in the early stages of uh, working with a more rural commu uh, community general practice, which um, has a constituency of uh, gypsy travellers, um, uh, and we hope to have a, a project in there soon. So there are various different things that we're we're using to inform the work that we're, uh, we're using going forward. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, yes, just as, as, as David has explained in, in relation to health, um, the, the equality portfolio um, also is engaged in, in a range of, of initiatives which will add to the information uh, and knowledge that we have about the communities. Um, obviously, we had a question in the 2011 census about um, identity as, as a gypsy traveller for the first time. Um, so our st statistical colleagues um, are continuing to process the information uh, from that and there has recently been um, a, a release um, uh, of information about gypsy travellers in relation to, I think, employment and health and a number of other factors. And that's ongoing work which will continue to build the, the evidence base and is something that we uh, committed to the, the, the committee to do some years ago. Um, not, not Scottish Government directly, but obviously um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission has recently uh, produced some research into site provision, uh, identifying good practice, uh, three sites in, in Scotland and I think Carlisle um, in England, uh, and has made some useful recommendations there, and William will, will know more, more about that. Um, but also in terms of the work that, that we do in, in the development of the strategy and in our, our funding programme um, on the equality side, we fund a number of organisations. MECOP has been mentioned uh, this morning already. We also fund Article 12, which works with young gypsy travellers in, in particular. Um, as Mr Finney mentioned, you know, why should the young gypsy traveller believe anything that we say? And I absolutely take that point. But one of the ways we're trying to address that is to build um, a, a cohort of young gypsy travellers who ha have, their, have the capacity to engage and to be involved in consultation to speak for their community and be the leaders of the future. That's certainly what we aspire to from, from that um, funding. Uh, we're also funding the Friends of Romano Lav, which is a, a, a representative group for, for Roma people in Scotland um, who very much want to be engaged um, with, with the government and on behalf of their community, but again realise that they're, they're, they have some way to go before they have the capacity to do that. So we have, we have brought them onto the, the strategy development group in order that they can uh, have that experience and, and uh, learn from that uh, too. Um, so I, I think a whole, whole range of things that, that we're doing, um, both on the, the hard research side with the statistical um, evidence gathering but all, and analysis, but also um, in, in our funding of organisations to enable them to work with the community um, directly um, and, and add to the evidence base. And, and on the um, Gypsy Traveller Site Working Group, the, the group met four times last year and quite a, a large part of the, the, the meetings were taken up by receiving reports from um, various stakeholders. Um, also asking some questions, we sent out questionnaires to local authorities trying to get up to date um, data on numbers of sites and condition of sites. We also, um, as officials, have made, um, made a priority to go out and meet um, gypsy travellers in the sites, not just local authority sites, but also private sites. And even, um, I'm looking at my notes here, but I think we've paid a couple of visits to unauthorised sites as well. So we're trying to get a, an understanding firsthand of the condition of sites and also of um, the individual's experience of those sites. And we're learning, of course, from that, just how varied that experience is. We're learning quite a bit about how good sites can be developed, often privately in places like South Lanarkshire. We're learning, too, about the 
the experience in Falkirk, where um, over quite a lengthy period of time, um, the, the community was brought round to understanding how how a site could be integrated and made made acceptable, and we've been um, looking at that in terms of some um, academic research that was carried out by Salford University, um, trying to draw out the lessons that might be applied in other areas. So again, um, using the, the the working group to acquire um, a better understanding both in the abstract, but also uh, as far as we can, um, first-hand from our own experience, a bit like the Minister, trying to get out there and, and understand from what we see um, to understand the, the, the nature of the problems. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I'll pass you over to John Mason now. Convener, it, you, you wrote to the Convener, I think we've got the copy of the letter, in January, and... Um, you talked about a forthcoming briefing for elected members, uh, local councillors, I think. Um, so I was wondering, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about that? And I mean, do you think the problem is that the local councillors don't understand what the responsibilities are? Or is it just that in some cases they are so much under pressure by vocal groups in the settled community that they find it very difficult to, for example, produce sites and things? I think it varies from place to place, John. Certainly five or six years ago when I was Minister for Housing and Communities, there's no doubt in my mind at all that councillors both in Aberdeen City and in Aberdeen Shire were under enormous pressure about the unofficial sites in and around a, both Aberdeen Shire and Aberdeen City. I mean, the seafront in Aberdeen, if I remember correctly, was one of the more controversial unofficial sites that were being used by gypsy travellers, and it had caused enormous problems with the local community um, and was one of the reasons why um, Ryan Adam approached me to see what uh, action we could take. And sometimes, I'll be quite honest, you know, the attitude of uh, local councillors itself isn't always as enlightened, perhaps, as it could and should be. Um, and I think we have some educational work to do in some areas as well about, you know, these are human beings who have the same human rights as the rest of us. And indeed, one of the areas of work that I'm taking forward, both in relation to Gypsy Travellers, but more widely, is in relation to SNAP, the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights. Uh, and I had a meeting the other day with the chair of the Scottish Human Rights Commission, Professor Alan Miller, and uh, I'm setting up a cross-government group uh, just to look at the progress we are making in terms of SNAP, the Scottish National Action Plan on Human Rights, and obviously um, improved improving the delivery of human rights in all its uh, different guises for the gypsy traveller community as part of the action plan, uh, and that will be another tool, as it were, that we will use to measure progress uh, in, along with the Commission uh, in terms of uh, how, how much we're actually achieving on the ground with all these initiatives that are going on. Because, I mean, I take your point, and you, you made it in that letter as well, that you know decisions are best made often, usually at a local level with local knowledge and local accountability in these things. But the reality is we have not seen progress. And, I mean, we are dealing with a national issue here, aren't we? Because one of the things about the Gypsy Travellers, they're not attached to just one area. They're often attached to a number of areas. I mean, I wonder if you feel that, you know, there is more, of, I either call it a lead or, I mean, you're talking about guidance. I don't know how strong that guidance is, really. Uh, but some kind of pressure or lead from the centre on local authorities to really get, get something to happen. Well, can I say, I wouldn't say we haven't made progress. I do, I do think we have made progress. I mean, if you've heard what David just alone said in terms of uh, access to GP facilities, and I think there has been some some progress made in that uh, as one example. I think there's progress made in aspects of housing and, and various other things, but the, the progress is variable across the country. There is no doubt about that. And overall, the progress isn't as fast or as great as I would have liked to see have seen. And I think we've got to look at, and that's part of the strategic work that's going on, which obviously involves members of the gypsy traveller community, is what do we need to do in this strategy to make it happen much more than is the case and make it much less variable and less of a postcode lottery than it actually is. Uh, now, obviously, not every local authority has a gypsy traveller community. They tend to be 
um, confined to a, a number of local authorities and therefore we're working particularly with those local authorities. I've already mentioned the Aberdeen and Grampian area. Uh, Falkirk, I think, is another area where um, there is a bit of a concentration of gypsy travellers as well. So we, we need to work particularly with those local authorities where there is a permanent gypsy traveller presence. Um, because there are some local authorities where there is very little or no presence whatsoever. I mean, while accepting that there are signs of progress, I mean, when, when we were up in Aberdeenshire, for example, I mean, we very much got the impression that it was the isolated primary school where there was a good relationship. It was an isolated GP practice where there was a good relationship. You know, it was far from common. And, and in fact, people, uh, gypsy travellers were often going to places because they knew that school, unlike the majority, had a good relationship. That GP practice had a good relationship. I mean, we had a quote from MECOP, um, I'll not read the whole thing, but p part of it, this was them quoting a, a gypsy traveller saying, surely by now the government has enough evidence about what needs to be done. Can't they just get it done in instead of endlessly talking? Only then will gypsy travellers like me start to take it seriously. I mean, my fear is that... I mean, we've made a lot of effort to engage as a committee, but there does come a time when people start shutting off because they just feel there's no progress. I have no doubt there's an element of that and there's an element of frustration, but I think uh, there's also uh, clearly members of the Gypsy Traveller community who do recognise that progress has been made. And, you know, th the, those people involved, for example, in the strategic working group are not wasting their time. They're in there because they believe it's going to make a difference. But I do accept uh, that there is a lot of frustration that it's not happening quicker and more universally. And that's a frustration that's shared by us. Now, if... If we, um, you know, if we need to take a more deregist approach, if that's what the strategy says, then I'm prepared to take a more deregist approach if that's what's required to make it happen. Uh, but I think, you know, how we do that, I, I, I would suggest has to be informed by the strategy because the whole point of the strategy is it's involving the stakeholders, including and in particular the gypsy traveller community. I to move on to Jane now. Cabinet Secretary, um, when the committee published its report in 2013 about where gypsy travellers lived, uh, live, it, there was real concerns about the quality of sites and the conditions of sites. So I'd, I'd like to know, um, and William made reference earlier to some work that's going on, but um, what's been done to address those poor conditions? And if councils are non-compliant, what will the Scottish Government do about that? Are they going to monitor the outcomes or will there be sanctions? Well, basically, as I said, what we're going to be doing in, in May is publishing the guidance on the quality of the sites and also the rights and responsibilities of both the owners and the occupants of the sites. Now, if I can draw a parallel with the social housing more generally, as you know, we have the Scottish Quality Housing Standard, um, which is the way in which we monitor the progress of social landlords, both councils and housing associations, in terms of the quality of housing they provide. So I am equating the guidance that we are going to publish in May, and I expect it to have exactly the same standing as the Scottish Quality and Housing Standards, because very clearly the objective of every social landlord in Scotland is to meet those standards, and indeed every investment plan that we approve, and we don't provide funding if it doesn't, um, every investment plan in every local authority area for housing and in every housing association uh, at its core has the need to bring all their housing stock up to Scottish Quality Housing Standard by a certain period. So I want to see as vigorous a system applied in terms of the quality of sites for uh, gypsy travellers. And what if they're not? If they're not, then we, we uh, then have to have a look at what we need to do to, to get it sorted. Um, you know, there's a possibility at the end of the day of sanctioning the local authority. Um, there's a possibility that we say, well, they won't get grant funding for various things if they don't actually raise the standard. You know, this, the starting point I always have in these things is if they're failing, as some have failed, I mean, generally speaking, for example, local authorities are much further behind in the Scottish Quality Housing Standard than are the housing associations. Now, my approach to that has always been initially to try to use dialogue to get the local authority sector to improve its performance, and very often that works, particularly in relation to specific local authorities. And 
the thing, but the thing that works the most effectively is to say, well, look, if you don't improve, then don't bother coming to us for grant funding for more council housing. Why would we throw good money after bad? So very often it's the cash that speaks the loudest when you're dealing with local authorities. Bit and stick. Um, and can we move on to the next question? Um, just ch changing the subject slightly, Cabinet Secretary. I'm interested in, in the implementation of the Children and Young People Scotland Act, and in particular, GERFIC and in particular the named person, um, which is a little bit controversial at the moment, but I'm wondering how that, all that's going to apply in the context of, of the Gypsy Traveller community. Well, well, my view is that the named person system, and of course there's been a lot of rubbish written about the named person, you know, utter rubbish in the press about it, but uh, I think the named person concept is particularly applicable in uh, a, you know, the Gypsy Traveller community because by definition they are travelling people. And one of the problems we have, whether it's making sure they get proper access to health services or proper access to education services or proper access to any housing services that they wish, is the fact that they are travelling. Um, and, and very often the travelling is travelling from one local authority area to another. And that makes it particularly difficult. So in terms of implementing the named person legislation, there are particular challenges around the Gypsy Traveller community, but they are challenges that I believe we've got to face and find solutions to. And we're working with our education colleagues in all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll move on to Sandra White now. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Convener. As I said, good morning. I wanted to pick up on what David had mentioned when he was replying to John Finney in regard to the NHS and uh, you know, working with the gypsy uh, travelling community, particularly in the, the way of carers. And obviously you mentioned about the respite care for d disabilities. Uh, can you tell me how you're going to uh, you know, s speak to the NHS boards to get them to actually come together with the gypsy travellers to ensure that they get the same rights as anyone else would uh, in regards to care, you know, caring facilities? David? Yeah, um, uh, of course, I mean, absolutely, uh, gypsy travellers should have the same rights as anyone else, and that's uh, um, very clear in, in, uh, in our approach. Um, what we've found is that, that um, as part of the work of the, the, the strategy development group, um, we've, we've had presentations from a number of NHS boards as to um, their approach. We've had NHS Health Scotland, Grampian, and Fife as part of the, the, the development work. Um, and each of, uh, each of those has taken a different approach. So Health Scotland obviously did the uh, research and have some conclusions for, for, for the strategy. Um, with um, uh, Grampian, we heard about the Clinterty halting site and the, um, and the work there, and I think the committee has been to visit um, the site. Um, and I think it's fair to say that, that um, uh, you, you did there get a situation where um, uh, travellers were, gypsy travellers were travelling to that, um, uh, that place in order to get medical services. Um, uh, the interesting example that we heard from Fife uh, was one where they've actually undertaken a needs assessment of gypsy travellers within their community. Um, and that has had, uh, that was, took place in uh, 2013 um, and has had a, a very specific plan coming from that where, for example, um, uh, there's been sharing of information amongst um, uh, health and social care staff. They've worked with NHS 24 and the Scottish Ambulance Service to support the community. Um, they've put in place named leads for education, health visiting uh, and other things. And I think that's something that we could potentially um, uh, learn from uh, in, in, in the context of the strategy development group. I think it would also be helpful to say um, that um, uh, another good example is uh, with NHS 24 uh, with a new 111 number. Uh, where NHS 24 have, over the past six months, uh, taken specific steps to um, uh, work with the gypsy traveller community to promote the use of the 111 number to gypsy travellers. So there are all sorts of different initiatives, and I think the, the key is um, learning from those in, in, the, in the strategy. Can I mention another one, Sandra, in relation to that? And that is, when I was health secretary, we uh, took the decision that everybody in Scotland should have an electronic patient record uh, by 2020, if not earlier. Now, actually, the electronic patient record, one of the benefits will be that travelling people will have their own record. So even if they do travel from health board area to health board area, um, the fact that it's an electronic patient record, so if they go into a GP practice uh, or a, to an A&E department, for example, they will be able to access their medical history immediately 
um, provided obviously they have the authorisation from the from the patient, which one would assume they would have in those circumstances. So the electronic patient record will be another tool which will help us very much, uh, and I'm particularly concerned about youngsters, um, you know, uh, in terms of inoculations and all the rest of it, uh, the electronic patient record will capture all of that, so you'll be very quickly uh, able to establish exactly what their medical history is, and that will help in terms of treatment as well. The other thing is that David mentioned in the, his previous remarks, which I think should not be underestimated, is the opportunity of the new negotiations on the GP contract, which must be completed by May 2000 or April 2017. As you know, at the moment, the GP system operates on the basis of a panel of patients. Um, and if you're not on the panel of patients, then it can be very difficult to get treated. Now, again, this is a very particularly difficult issue with travelling people, because by definition, they're travelling from one area to another. And even if they're in the same local authority area, or the same health board area, um, if they're travelling between different GP catchment areas, then it's very difficult. Very often they don't bother registering with a GP in the first place. Um, and I think one of the things um, that the government wants to achieve out of the GP negotiations, contract negotiations, is a system uh, that would make it much easier for travelling people to access primary care services without necessarily having to be you know, registered with one particular GP practice. Uh, so that that's obviously for negotiation, but I think it's an opportunity for us to improve the service. And I don't think we should underestimate the, the importance of that opportunity. Right. Just uh, thank you very much. And I, I think you sort of pre-empted my, my other question regarding handheld records. It would certainly improve than the electronic one, because obviously... You know, we have had evidence that say that health boards uh, just, you know, are saying it's a problem with the handheld records and uh, the gypsy travellers are saying it's an excuse they're making. So I'm assuming that that would make a great improvement then. Absolutely. Can I say handheld records are a problem for everybody, not just for gypsy travellers? I mean, uh, as you know, I represent a constituency in Lanarkshire and one of the common problems I have in dealing with complaints against the NHS is that somebody perhaps being treated between two hospitals, say between Monklands and Heard Myers, when they attend here, Myers, their notes are in Monklands and, and not, they've not been transferred for an appointment. Sometimes if they're dealing, for example, with the Beetson in Glasgow, but their notes are in, say, the Monklands, and the notes haven't been transferred to the Beetson because the Beetson's only for one appointment. They're still basically hosted by the Monklands. So the, the handheld records are a problem for everybody. Uh, it's not unique to the gypsy traveller community, and it's one of the reasons why the introduction of the electronic patient record, I think, is so important and could be so beneficial to everybody, but particularly beneficial to the gypsy traveller community. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And we'll move swiftly over to Christian now. Thank you, Mr. A couple of questions. First of all, I was in Clinton uh, last week, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, by all means, I spoke directly to a. Uh, to, uh, to, 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 to the Gypsy Travers community. And one of the things very important, the message was given, <laughs> is that uh, local authorities have, have failed. This committee has failed to some extent, and the government has failed. Uh, we maybe progressed a lot on the understanding of these communities, but we're not pro progressing at all on, 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 on the practicability. And one of the things which was, you know, the message was very, very strong. Uh, because local authority has failed, because country government failed, because we failed uh, 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 creating new sites, is there not time to empower? And I'm, I'm quite happy to see that on your on your uh, uh, on your letter that explains the way of promoting good practice in handling planning application for gypsy travellers uh, site. But would be not be better to empower the communities to have their own site and finding a way, because we know the St. Ceres, for example, sites, which has been uh, uh, created without planning uh, uh, planning process. I think we, they're asking for, for uh, uh, a backdated uh, 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 pl pl planning application. But it's so important. How can we help to do that? And do you think that's really the direction where should, where should, should, should we take, empowering these communities to have their own sites? Well, they need to be subject to some kind of overall planning mechanism, obviously, because you can't just go and uh, set up a site anywhere that you can go anywhere willy and early and build a house. You have to have some kind of uh, management control over that, uh, local authority level, land use control, planning control, and all the rest of it. But in the same way that I can decide what site I want to build a house on, um, 
and, and they are then applying for planning permission, I don't see why we shouldn't have a parallel similar system for people, the gypsy traveller community, who identify a site and they would like to put a permanent site there. But it has to be, I think, subject to um, approval by the local authority because you can't have an anarchy, an anarchy reigning in any of this where people can just decide to build houses or establish sites of, or anything, just wherever they like without any kind of planning or building control or whatever. So subject to those that, that qualification, I think you know they should be able uh, to identify areas where they want sites and then apply for the appropriate planning permission or building warrant permission or whatever permissions are required to do it. Absolutely. Do we mark some site as well for community buyouts? Because we, we are talking about we, community Well, buyouts. again, you know, I, I don't see why not, provided it's subject to the normal, and the whole point is to the normal procedures that uh, would happen where it you know, a, a community buyout today. Um, I, we can't just have people doing it willy-nilly without going through proper procedures because you have to look at the, the wider picture. But in principle, why not? I'd love you to, to come and meet some, some of us. Yeah, uh, yeah. and, and we'll fix up a time, and the next time I'm in the Aberdeen area, we'll do that, Chris. Yeah. Uh, one 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 of uh, uh, a question I would like to ask is about uh, what uh, direct work you can do uh, to uh, to reduce discrimination uh, against gypsy travellers for their communities. You talked about uh, you were going to have a campaign in the autumn, but you're thinking about having some of the work during the summer. Are you thinking maybe having having a, a big event or something really? Because a campaign could be sometimes seen as another campaign. How can we do really make, make a big difference? Well, I mentioned the marketing campaign because it's the first time it's ever been done. Um, but before we actually decide the shape of the campaign, you asked earlier about research. We're actually doing a lot of, if you like, market research on what would be the most effective kind of campaign to run. What should be the tone of the campaign? Who should the campaign be aimed at? Uh, should we use social media rather than, say, TV advertising or press media? So there's loads of questions that we're doing market research just now on putting that together so that because it's such a sensitive issue that we need to make sure we get it right I don't want to end up with something that um, is counterproductive uh, because we haven't done our proper research and our proper preparation and I also want to make sure we end up with a marketing campaign that's effective and targeted at the right people you, you reckon it's got to be a positive campaign move and absolutely yes Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any other questions they'd like to ask the Cabinet Secretary? Could I just... Yes, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Kavina. I just wondered how, you know, direct support payments, how that would fit in. I know we've not got much time, but would we be able to uh, write, you know, to the Cabinet Secretary maybe get an update on that? How, how that would work in with, obviously, health and social care. Yeah, self-directed support, well. you mean, Sandra? Self-directed yeah. support. Yeah. Sorry, yes, yeah, self-directed support. Aye. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm sure David will make sure you get a comprehensive reply to that. It might be useful, actually. I don't know if we've got the stats, if we're able to identify how many members of the Gypsy Traveller community are already on self-directed support. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. thank, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary and officials, for coming along and giving us that information. And we'll take up your <coughs> offer and write to you asking some other questions as well, I'm sure. Thank you very much. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will take place on Thursday the 5th of March. I'll now suspend the meeting for the committee to move into private session. Thank you. <laughs>